There's a weapon in Dead Cells that I absolutely love, called the Spite Sword, a melee weapon that reveals its true power when things get tough. The sword inflicts critical damage when the player is cursed, or for the next 8 seconds after the player takes any damage. It's a great weapon to use during the beginning biomes, but I would wager that I only have that opinion because I eat mounds of shit when it comes to dead cells, and thanks to YouTube's new cursing regulations, I can declare that fact loud and proud in my very first paragraph. The thorns buff is a bit of a staple in video games. A thorns buff basically adds a window of forgiveness to a player for taking damage while not completely outweighing the benefits of more preferred strategies like patiently studying enemy movement so as not to take damage in the first place. Buffs like these have garnered a bit of a negative reputation over time, and a lot of more experienced players tend to see these benefits as a set of training wheels that someone who is new to the game never learned how to play without. It's a simple and straightforward means of giving the player a fair amount of comeuppance if they take damage from something. If you didn't see an enemy preparing an attack, or maybe you did and couldn't react in time, or maybe you jump down a ledge without looking, and plunge yourself ass first into an embarrassingly conspicuous pit of spikes. Well, if you're using a weapon like the Spite Sword, then it's not going to matter where the damage comes from. As long as the player has taken some form of damage, the buff will be active for the next 8 seconds of gameplay. I think because of this, the Spite Sword is a perfect example of what should not be considered a Thorns buff. 8 seconds is a pretty long time in Dead Cells, and with a buff like this, you can very easily cut through droves of enemies at a time, potentially even one-shotting zombies, all because you took a single instance of damage that could have been a pretty hard hit, or it could have been a glancing blow from, I don't know, a rat or something. I have a small list of criteria for what I would consider to be a Thorns buff. The first and most important detail is that the player must take damage obviously. Meaning certain items like the Armor of Thorns from Dark Souls isn't exactly what I'm looking for because you do damage by evasion and not taking hits yourself. However, it may not deal enough damage for the player to consider the act of getting hit an actually viable strategy. Part of using a Thorns ability in a game is the understanding that it'll likely be rendered obsolete once you've spent enough time with the game to learn the ropes of its combat. I recognize the modern 0 to 10 rating system, but we do need to understand with abilities like these there is a ceiling somewhere. Secondly, the buff can't be activated by hazards or obstacles. And third and finally, the damage or negative condition applied to the enemy attacking you must be an immediate response that's over as soon as it started. Instead of a whole ass 8 second buff that's so powerful I'm pretty sure there's a Spite Sword only speedrun guide out there somewhere on Reddit that someone probably spent a lot of time on. Despite having only done maybe two videos on Dead Cells, one of which performed great and the other having performed about as well as a Thanatopho playing a side character in Macbeth, I've spent more than enough time with it off screen to pretty confidently know the things I like about it and the things I don't care for, the former definitely making a much more crowded list. One of which being the fact that Dead Cells makes it easy to replace items you don't want by making sure a constant stream of loot is always available. I mean shit, it might even be a little too much at times, honestly. Pretty recurringly do I find myself being tugged back and forth between committing to a semi-serious melee brutality build with light speed and Hattori's katana, and turning a 3BC run into journalist mode because if an L-quality explosive crossbow shoves itself in my face, well I can't just ignore it now, can I? The beauty of the weapons in Dead Cells is that they're never at a shortage, and if the RNG need decided to cock you from the word go and give you the high bullshit boots as your first roll, there's usually always another option not too far down the road. This is doubly important for amulets because replacing that shit biscuit of a prisoner's collar is one of the first things you should be doing. Amulet affixes can drastically affect gameplay by assigning extra qualities to your movements and attacks. It can be as simple as just dealing extra damage, or as convoluted as enemies burning when you hit them, freezing when they die, exploding when they cough too loudly, sending Jeff Keighley back to the Shadow Realm by tricking him into saying his name backwards out loud, something or other. One of such affixes gives you the ability to return damage to its sender, and this is where I can declare that it's not the best kind of ability like this on the list, yet it's a far cry from being even remotely bad, because rarely ever is this buff only damage. Enemies that do damage to you can also do anything from freeze, burn, release toxic fumes, electrify, all the way to exploding into flesh-eating minions that attack other enemies near it after it dies. This becomes extremely important when you see that other weapons and tools also contain modifiers like this. 
because if you have certain affixes, you can end up creating an infinite feedback loop of turbo violence. If you know one of your melee options gives enemies free status, for example, then you can be on the lookout for amulet affixes that do a multiplied amount of damage to frozen enemies. Attaining miraculous coin flip loadouts like this are so few and far between, though, because once you get perspective on the game's incredibly large item pool, complemented by an entire second pool of buffs and modifiers, only then do you realize just how much of your loadout is decided by a dice roll. And I do understand if all the control that sacrifices can be enough to turn some away from it. But I personally think that makes it only more hysterical on the runs where you find Lightning Bolt, and every other item in your inventory deals bonus damage to electrified enemies. It's funny how buffs that are meant to be replaced in some games can be the linchpin in others, and I think most of it boils down to not what the buff can do by itself, but the fact that it's put into conversation with the modifiers you already have. Hollow Knight's Thorns of Agony is a utility that's largely independent from most other charms in the game, and coincidentally it gargles the largest amount of dick. And that's what we in the comedy business call an intentional exaggeration. I don't really think it's that awful. On the scale of utility, it probably isn't even the worst charm in the game. It has one of the lowest asking prices of any charm in the game, so even if you do put it on and you think it sucks, it's not like you're mending a broken heart on the way back to the nearest bench to take it off. But the fact that the honestly negligible comeuppance given to you by this charm can introduce a whole other array of drawbacks by itself makes me feel like it can at least find a home somewhere in between Heavy Blow and the Water Gun from Dead Rising. I'm gonna try to avoid any polarizing statements here, because I respect the necessity of buffs like these as a concept. Not getting hit isn't the answer to every single challenge in every single game, and these abilities certainly have just as big a place in a game as any others. But even on that premise, the damage this charm returns to enemies when you get hit is just too negligible for me to even consider this worth having. The range of this ability is deceptively small, and half the time I end up not even hitting anything with it despite taking damage myself. Thorns of Agony also doesn't give soul upon hitting an enemy, which is the ability's fatal flaw in my opinion. You use soul to heal. F fucking duh. I'm a Hollow Knight channel, of course. After getting hit, you almost always have an opportunity to melee the enemy anyways. You can get some more soul out of those attacks, and then you can heal, but you kinda can't do that if the thorns kill the enemy you would have used to get soul. I promise I'm not going to make this a running joke for the whole video, but I do really feel like Dead Cells and Hades can stand as testaments of what a great idea it is to have a gameplay structured where one function always lends itself to something else. And if I'm making it sound like this is only exclusive to roguelike experiences, then let me go ahead and say Hollow Knight already does this exact thing, and just seems to leave Thorns of Agony to the wayside. The only notable interaction this charm has is with Stalwart Shell, which decreases the animation time of Thorns while still keeping the extra iframes. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, here's the punchline. There's also a synergy between Stalwart Shell and Quick Focus that's so good it's borderline exploitative. Between the sped up healing and extra iframes, you can effectively replenish a point of HP before you can even be allowed to get hit again. Having thorns on means you're gonna spend a decent chunk of those iframes trapped in an animation that you didn't ask for, taking away the iframes that could have been used for healing even with the decreased time it takes for it to deploy. I'm gonna say that again. The only significant thorn synergy in the whole entire game, and it sabotages others that are objectively more useful. Sit on a fucking pencil. And I'm not saying this charm is bad. No, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. But in the spirit of fairness, I can at least extend the point that you're never really in a situation where an ability like this has to be good. There's a sense of deliberacy that comes with Hollow Knight. Dead Cells and Hades can get away with the systems they have, not because they're in the same genre, but because there's so much shit flying around the screen in the endgame that your room for mistakes is practically none. And taking glancing blows from something is kind of inevitable, which is the exact opposite of Stardew Valley. The benefits from this buff should only ever be considered comeuppance for getting hit. The utility of the buff should never exceed the benefits of just not taking a hit in the first place. And that's exactly what Stardew Valley's Thorns Ring gives you. Nothing more, nothing less. If you're wearing the Thorns Ring, the ring takes the base damage of the monster that attacked you, subtracts the monster's defense, and then applies the remainder. If something hits for 24 and its defense is 6, then that's an average ass 18. And unless you're in the Skull Caverns, the defense of any given monster almost never goes above a single digit number anyways, so what you end up getting is the base damage of the attack minus, like, 2. This shouldn't come as a huge surprise to anyone, because Stardew Valley is mainly a farming sim with some minor RPG elements. 
you wouldn't expect it to throw you a fully fleshed out platinum game style combat system just because you wanted to find a few rocks. You get the crafting recipe for this item at combat level 7, meaning you receive it just in time for its benefits to go from game-breakingly OP to point-defeatingly worthless. Farming copper in the upper levels of the mine gets somehow even less stressful because half of the monsters run into you and dispatch themselves in one or two hits. So I guess if you want to earn yourself weird looks by being the one adventurer in the guild who runs around sword in hand headbutting shit like the shitter they are, then well, I guess the thorns ring is the item for you. The ring does its job, I'll say that much. You unlock better rings and equipment as you continue leveling up combat, so it's kind of obvious that this ring was designed to eventually be replaced. A buff like this should never be powerful enough to convince someone that running into shit and intentionally taking damage is the more efficient alternative. Even if it is really fucking funny. I've honestly never seen the ring go past the 30s in damage. Meanwhile, if you've made it to the deeper parts of the Skull Cavern, you've probably found a sword somewhere that inflicts such large chunks of damage that you'll be looking at the numbers 15 and 27, and your brain just will not distinguish them. Overall, this is about as average of a buff as you can find. It's meant to be replaced, and it never gets in your way, which objectively puts it above Thorns of Agony in my book, and yes, I do see the problem with following a perceived objective point with a subjective phrase like in my book to argue it away, and uh, I dare you to try and make me change it. Oh, look at that, moving on to the next paragraph. Sorry, I already put a period at the end of the, at the, end of the sentence. Uh, backspace key's broken, fuck. Sorry. If being myself is wrong, then I don't want to be right. So what if this script suddenly hard pivots into an irrelevant hyperfixation on how much I loved Final Fantasy X when I was a kid? The amount of times I broke something around the house because I was swinging an old stick I found in the backyard pretending it was the fucking Kalad Bulg is none of your damn business. Granted, the battle menu slowly being imprinted into your mental imagery due to excess exposure has some pretty cool benefits. I can now decently argue that the counterattack skill can be considered a type of Thorns ability, and honestly, quite a damn good one. Customization is a key component in all role-playing games. Yes, I see the floor is made of floor, meaning this ability not only meets all the criteria I outlined earlier, but it also gives you the added benefit of attaching it to weapons and armor pieces that you're more likely to use, instead of it just being hard-baked onto a single piece of equipment. The counterattack skill, like most uh, things in Final Fantasy, have been a staple of the franchise for a while. But I'm aware that going into the history of Final Fantasy mechanics is a very slippery slope into a one-way rabbit hole I can't confidently dig myself out of. So I'm going to do your attention span a favor and just say that 10 is far from the first game that used it. The idea of the counterattack is simple yet effective. If an enemy targets a character with an attack and that character is able to counter it, they will then respond with an attack of their own without affecting the battle order. Part of what makes this so powerful early game is that the skill damage isn't modified in any way. This means the counterattack is doing all the work of a regular attack, including the potential to hit critically. This sounds overpowered on the surface, and it definitely can be, but I will go ahead and remind you that turn-based RPGs have notoriously deep combat systems that usually come with rulebooks the size of a James Cameron screenplay. Attacking a certain enemy may not always be the best idea if they have an armor stat that works against the damage you would do. Enemies have all sorts of unique responses to being attacked in certain ways, and some of them even have counterattack skills of their own. So automating battles like this usually isn't free of risk. There are variants to this ability, such as Evade Encounter and Magic Counter as well, which can be used to broaden up how your party can respond to different attacks. And I think that's part of why these abilities work in such a turn-based climate. These skills are part of a much bigger system, which is why they offer so much more than just forgiveness because you got hit. They actually feel like utilities that can be optimized. You can build actual strategies around these skills if you set yourself up properly. Equipping the magic counter skill on a weapon with a particular element alignment can actually be incredibly strong. But you would only know to do that if you fought a particular enemy that's weak to that strategy. You would think even these abilities have shelf lives because there are plenty of late game enemies that respond to physical attacks by using magic or inflicting harmful ailments to your party and just all sorts of bad shit. Surprisingly, this isn't a huge problem you run into since the battle system is designed in a way where counterattacks don't trigger enemy effects that could result in more trouble for you. The only actual problem this creates is when one of your party members are inflicted with confusion, leading them to attack allies. And if that ally has a counterattack weapon, then you better believe lethal force will be enacted to sit their ass down. 
I'm going to stop mentioning the fact that these abilities tend to perform extremely well in the early stages of a game, but extremely poorly by the end game, because the more of these I go through, the more I'm thinking diminishing returns should have been the fourth and final criteria. Risk of Rain 2 is a game I've spent hundreds of hours playing. It was one of the first roguelites I ever enjoyed, excluding Dead Cells, and ultimately the reason I decided to give other games like Hades and Skull a chance. And that isn't me writing in some snide preamble telling you that my opinion should be treated with some kind of authority. That's me clearly outlining the fact that I hold this game in high praise because I don't want my criticisms against it to sound like I'm shitting in someone's dinner without reason. Razorwire is a decent comeuppance buff that can be stacked for more damage later on down the road. A lot of how Risk of Rain works, however, doesn't come down to the individual items themselves, but, once again, how those items synergize with one another. Most of these synergies are positive, simply because there's lots of buffs that increase damage, albeit in many different ways. Some buffs give flat damage increases, while others can scale, and you have items that can chain damage to other targets, make enemies explode upon death, give you more movement speed, help you finish elites quicker, save you 10% or more on your car insurance, and a bunch of other crazy utilities that prepare you for the chaos of the late game, where one firm slap on the ass from just about anything is enough to kill you. They aren't common, but there are some pretty cursed negative synergies out there as well. And herein lies the tragedy of Razorwire. The thing is, Razorwire would be a half-decent buff if there weren't other abilities in the game that could hard counter it to the point of uselessness. Items like Tougher Times and Rose Buckler offer the player a chance to ignore damage entirely, and taking glancing blows from bullets you missed is how items like Razorwire deal their damage. So if you're getting hit less frequently, then you're only beating the utility of Razorwire that much further into the pit it's already in. The end result is just a little over net zero if you're unlucky enough to catch both of these in a single loop. And as brilliant as this game is, having one buff that can directly dick over another in a game with randomized item pools is an incredibly bad idea in my opinion. Not only that, but Risk of Rain's item pool, and I guess for that matter, Risk of Rain itself, is sort of anchored around the pretense of embracing ridiculousness. The common items you find range anywhere from raw stakes to fireworks to stunner shades, less common items like scythes, blood infusions, and musical instruments, and beyond this point the game just takes the plunge into full nutter butter territory and starts giving you tesla coils, spell tomes, and cursed artifacts and whatever the fuck it can think of. If that didn't sound ridiculous enough, each item you carry with you is physically represented somewhere on the survivor. There are few things more laughably empowering than arriving to the zenith of a celestial randomizer looking like a multicultural Christmas tree, seeing ten giant Jenga blocks sliding around with health bars so large they run off the screen, and amusingly charging forth with the full intent of pounding every last one of them into the sand beneath your feet. And we aren't even going to talk about the fucking minions. I'm explaining all of this to you because it's the sea of chaos, alien heads, tesla matter condensers, and all that shit that ironically make abilities like razor wire look kinda dull. In other words, it's a decent ability by itself, but even more overshadowed and outclassed than what it would normally be by some of the more laughable options. Risk of Rain's item pool is already one giant shitpost as it is. It makes little sense to fight against that by rolling for armor-piercing rounds and rocket launchers when the game is conspicuously waving a ukulele and a fucking identity disc in your face, daring you to use them. It was surprising to me how much I ended up playing Risk of Rain because I tend to be a person that derives more entertainment from games when everything feels a bit more... I don't know, unified? Will o' the Wisps is extremely hard to say in voiceovers because all the S sounds make me feel like a whistling kettle. But at least it's a game with a format that I'm really familiar with. Whereas buffs like Razor Wire and Agony attack enemies outwards with an AoE, Ori's Thorn Shard is a bit more precise in that it focuses only on the enemy that attacked you. I actually prefer Thorn's abilities to work like this because they feel a bit more intent and focused. Not to mention it makes sense with a game like Ori because the ultimate goal of any ability in Ori never really lends itself to chaos. Ori makes you feel like there are other elements around you that deserve respect. And it's not like I think all the other games on this list here promote giving the finger to Mother Nature and selling yourself to the Joja Corporation, but I do think Ori is a great example of the abilities in-game actually reflecting that sentiment a little bit more. This is something I think these games here did right. Thorn's abilities like Razorwire and Agony are better because they provide the potential for more damage, which you might think is ultimately more worth it if you're wrong. Giving an ability like this the AoE treatment leaves way too much room for backfire. Take this with however many grains of salt you wish to take from an armchair game designer who participates in the development of one fan-made expansion and decides that he's Gabe goddamn Newell, but I feel like maybe the element of chaos is only fun to tinker around with when it's at the benefit of the player. Especially when this kind of chaos can ultimately lead to the player's undoing. 
In layman's terms, having an AoE Thorn's ability can feel much more useful because it can potentially damage multiple enemies at once, but it's not as amusing when that exact same ability sets off a nearby explosive hazard you didn't know existed and fucking kills you! This was the exact problem I always had with buffs like Thorns of Agony, because you can't even solve the problem by giving the player iframes, because half of what's explosive in Hollow Knight has a massive delay between when the explosive is triggered and when the explosive actually does damage to you. I don't dislike Thorns of Agony because it's some crutch used by players without pattern recognition skills or some bullshit. I dislike it because it's a buff that fails even at that mark. It's almost as though it was designed to be replaced or something. Wow, this really is going to be the whole video, isn't it? Holy shit. Maybe I should just reduce myself back to prose and poetic profanities with the purpose of predictably providing patrons their promised pleasure. There. Now can I get out of this bed I made myself yet? Pivoting back to roguelites though for a hot minute because I do realize in the script that there is this one particular game that I keep name dropping without actually paying lip service to it, so I guess I better explain why it's good. I had this period in time where I got really addicted and for that matter I would confidently say pretty goddamn good at Hades. Probably not speedrunner level, as is, you know, the truth with everything I play, but probably enough to stream it for an hour and not find any prolific backseaters. The only place I can imagine something like that happening in Hades anyways would be selecting which boon I wanted and then having to spend the next minute justifying why I went for the Vengeance boon instead of Hunter's Mark. Uh, because the Zeus spoons are fucking better, chat, that's why. And part of what makes them so good is their inherent ability to chain lightning damage to other nearby enemies. And trust me when I say a boon like that becomes exponentially more valuable once you've gotten to the point where there are more enemies on screen than there are errors in Yandere Dev's coding. The idea behind the Vengeance Boons is that the same foe that dealt damage to you will take damage themselves, fucking duh, but that boon also has an additional positive effect depending on who you receive it from. Athena's version deflects enemy projectiles for a short second, Zeus's version deals damage in an AoE from the enemy that damaged you, which is an extremely important distinction, I promise. Aphrodite's version damages foes in a small radius and makes the attack of every enemy in that radius weaker, so on and so forth. I can get into why I think this system is brilliant, but one, 17 other videos already exist about that exact same topic, and two, I'd rather not spend X amount of minutes turning this video into some analysis when C previous is apparently a much more entertaining path for you guys to go down. Regardless, this is another example of what I think makes a Thorn's ability not only good, but turns it into an in-game ability that's actually very useful, provided you end up with a selection of good enough boons that accentuate it. You can select one Vengeance Boon and then gradually make it more powerful by finding Palms of Power, which upgrade the level of a boon but provide diminishing returns the higher the level of the boon being selected. Acquiring boons from the same god, however, end up stacking over each other quite nicely. The Storm Lightning Boon, for instance, can enhance the effects of Lightning Strike and Electric Shot by making them bounce more. The High Voltage Boon can increase the radiance of boons like Thunder Flourish. Broken Resolve can make foes weaker for longer, while Sweet Surrender increases the amount of damage done to those weak targets. I can really stop at any time, I promise. Here, here's the wiki to keep you busy. Every god has their boons stacked in a way that builds off of what you currently already have, which is ultimately what ends up making abilities like the Vengeance Boons so god tier, pun intended. Because it's never just dealing damage to enemies that decide to get silly. It might also be slowing them down, making them more susceptible to critical hits for a few seconds, making their attacks weaker, and even exploiting their low alcohol tolerance. It's still never a good idea to give this much comeuppance to getting hit, since this can very easily reinforce bad habits, but the end game chambers get so chaotic that taking glancing blows from enemies you missed is honestly kind of unavoidable anyways. Even if you have boons that make it to where the Vengeance Boon isn't exactly efficient in terms of damage, there's usually always a status effect it will also inflict in tandem, which can lead to more shitty effects for that enemy. It's honestly the only kind of Thorns ability on this list that actually finds more uses depending on how much progress you make per run. And it's a bit of a testament to how much mileage you can get out of an otherwise disposable ability if you really want to. It offsets the usual shittiness that comes with the AoE version of this ability by assigning the epicenter of that damage to the enemy that hit you instead of the player itself. So if the effect ends up triggering an explosive, then well, I guess it's your problem now, you fucking bloat. Maybe check your confidence next time you decide to belly slam a demigod with a machine gun that's older than you are. Besides, if I'm looking for an opportunity to flex, I'm much more likely to preemptively bandage myself during a banshee encounter and use the downtime to get my burrito out of the microwave. And herein lies the true value of Darkwood's acid blood skill. Yeah, 
Try to stun lock me when you're a corpse, you fucking can opener. Just as simple as I can put this, Darkwood has a very unique combat system that I fell in love with when I was streaming it back in October. It was simple enough to do everything it needed while still providing a level of tension that made every altercation you had with something feel like a genuine struggle for survival. I'm going to try really hard not to just review this game right now and tell you how goddamn amazing it is at establishing atmosphere, conveying hopelessness, and renewing your childhood fear of things that go bump in the night, all while using one of the most unlikely perspectives that somehow takes away absolutely nothing from the experience. Uh, whoops. Darkwood has a skill system that involves you sampling the local flora and fauna, harvesting the organic materials and cooking them into a conveniently large syringe that you then thrust into your bloodstream. Each completed dose gives you access to a skill, the second tier presenting Acid Blood, Third Eye, and Runner. And although I'm writing down Acid Blood as one of the best Thorn type abilities on this list, it's only because it fucking cheated. There's only one real drawback I can think of for why Darkwood's top-down perspective can be kinda limiting. Because everything technically operates around a two-dimensional plane, a large portion of the encounters seem like they can all be dealt with using a similar strategy, i.e. stepping to the right and swinging a big stick. And while this doesn't sound all that engaging, this only creates additional degrees of separation and makes particular encounters with enemies that don't do that much more terrifying when that strategy suddenly doesn't work. Thickening the line between what this game establishes as normal enemies and what the game establishes as the end of this fucking night, I guess. I'm bringing this up because Acid Blood stands out from most other skills in that it has very clear circumstances where it performs like ass, and equally clear circumstances where it can actually break the game. It almost seems intentionally and solely designed to deal with a very specific mission in Chapter 2 because it's really good at killing a very particular type of intruder. I feel like this breaks the scale, honestly. I can pretty confidently say there's no other skill on this list where running entire missions with versus without it feel this night and day. I'm not kidding, it's like adjusting a difficulty slider. Are we like absolutely positive this skill doesn't disable Steam achievements or something? But the important question is, is it worth picking over Third Eye or Runner? I'm not sure if this is going to be a super polarizing opinion, but the more forests I found myself being lost in, the less room I felt like making for the runner perk. I only ever used this skill when I stumbled into a combat counter I didn't feel like dying to and needed to make haste out of there, but if you've been building decent stamina conservation habits, what they already give you is usually more than enough to make those encounters, you know, go away. Half the enemies in Darkwood have the spatial awareness of a toaster anyway, so running in a single direction for more than 5 seconds is usually enough for whatever was chasing you to lose interest. And if that opinion wasn't polarizing enough, then I also think Third Eye is only slightly better. Despite Third Eye seeing use in more situations, pun intended, I still just can't bring myself to sit here and believe the game intended for players to pick through the forest this meticulously. Especially when it seemed like every second chest I found forced me to double back to the hideout either because I forgot my lockpicks or so I could deposit my 26 matches, 15 boards, 38 nails, 7 scrap metal, 4 doses of Adderall, 8 rags, 5 wires, a toolbox, a full can of gas, and a fucking potato. And it's not like the game even penalizes you that much for wasting those materials, nor should it. I tallied up a pretty embarrassing number of nights where I accidentally walled myself out of the workbench room and had to dismantle a barricade in the dead of night just so I could get back in. And my no-object permanence having ass still made it to chapter 2 with a fucking Kalishnikov. Runner is a great utility if 10 extra seconds of turbo legs means more time I can spend putting two extra barricades up to prepare for the nightly hide and seek. Third Eye is also amazing if my mouse pad is pressed up against the wall of my desk for some reason, leading to limited in-game range of vision. But Acid Blood is a passive effect. This means 1. Its utility isn't limited to once per day, and 2. I don't forget that it's even an option by the time I've learned the ropes of the game well enough to properly survive and play without that extra help anyways. I obviously missed more than a few, but I can only offer knowledge on the games that I've played. So feel free to make addendums to the list in the comments and or tell me why you disliked one of them, since apparently that's how you're expected to do that now. Thanks for tuning in. See ya.